you recall, last week, those of you who were last week, uh, we were reading out of 1 Peter in the second chapter, and we read verses 11 and 12. And I said then that it was kind of a transitional um, uh, section of the letter, um, in that the, up until that point, Peter had been talking about a lot of doctrines, a lot of things to the, uh, the people who received this letter. And he had talked about things such as divine election and talking about the Holy Trinity's work in salvation, the promises of an eternal life, uh, the certainty uh, of, a, uh, of a, uh, an inheritance that was being protected by God. Uh, he talked about our being called as believers to be a holy priesthood. And so that and some other doctrines he'd been covering pretty extensively leading up to that passage. And in that passage, he says and gave us instructions for the, the living of what we described as a beautiful life. A good and an excellent behavior, a moral type of life, a life that when it is seen, it is beautiful in the eyes of God and even those around us. And so that kind of sets up the rest of his letter, or most of the rest of his letter. Because now he's going to drop back and says, since I've described this beautiful type of life that you're supposed to live, let's talk about how you're supposed to live that type of a life in different circumstances. And he's going to talk about how in our relationship, how to live that sort of a life in our relationship as Christians with regard to our government that we're under, whatever that government might be. Uh, also within the work environment, whatever work environment that is, and also even into our family and into our households. And so he's going to discuss these things. And this morning we're going to look at the first of these where he's talking about how we as the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ are supposed to to approach our dealings with the government or authority that has been placed above us. And so if you have your Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. 1 Peter chapter 2, 13 through 17. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, Fear God and honor the King. First of all, I want to say a couple little, couple little things about the government that was in place when Peter wrote this letter. And we complain a lot about our government. Let me tell you a little few things about that government that Peter, when he wrote these words, the government then, the world was controlled then with an iron fist by the Roman Empire. And while there was some form of representation, they did have a Senate, the Caesar, the emperor, reigned as the sovereign king. He made all the rules, he lived in any way that he wanted. Many of these emperors even claimed to be God, or a God. At the time of this writing, when Peter wrote this, the emperor in Rome was a fellow by the name of Nero. Nero is one of the most one of the most infamous, brutal, immoral rulers who have who have ever walked this planet. And the church at this time had become a target of his. You see, old Nero had a couple projects he wanted to do in Rome, but there was no vacant property. He had some grand schemes to build these big things that would honor him, but there wasn't any room, couldn't find any real estate. So he had to do something about it. He had to make some vacancies. And so he had a good portion of Rome set ablaze. And he burned buildings down to clear the property. And he blamed the Christians for doing it. 
And he made them enemies of the state. And they were hunted. Nero had a garden. He used Christians and lit them at night to light his gardens. This is an example of the government that was in place when Peter wrote this letter. Many believers, of course, you would imagine in Rome, they had to flee. They had to run. We see the, the refugees in Ukraine now. You can imagine that the Christians had to flee for their very lives out of Rome in the same way. The brutal persecution was chasing them. And they were leaving behind them their homes and their jobs and all their possessions, whatever they could carry. They had to get out and quickly. Remember the opening of the letter when Peter wrote this? He wrote to the Christians and he said, who are scattered out in Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia and Bithynia. They've been scattered. They were running for their lives because the persecution extended out even beyond the borders of Rome itself. But Christians were enemies of the state throughout the Roman Empire as it began to filter out. This was the government that was in place when Peter wrote these words. Now, the words that he is writing here about conduct and how to act is thought that this is kind of a restatement of what was known and circulated through Christians, through the church, and it was, uh, it was called the household rules. It was part of uh, the didache, uh, which was part of the... You see, they didn't have, have church for many, many, many years and centuries to build on. They didn't have a New Testament before them that they could read as we do to learn certain things about how it is that we're supposed to act. This church was brand new in the first century. They couldn't, they couldn't even have private pastors and preachers stand up every Sunday in a church to tell them and read from them letters like this. They were writing the letters. They needed to have some sort of direction as what was the perfect and the proper pattern of behavior that was expected if you were a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. How were they supposed to respond to government and authorities over them? How were they supposed to live in a godly, Christ-like marriage? Because the only thing they knew was pagan marriage. How were they supposed to teach and train their children and raise them up? How were they supposed to respond when there was uh, unfairness in the workplace and burdens and even slavery? How were they supposed to react to suffering and persecution? And so there were rules that were written out to help them to understand how God had instructed them to live. Remember, they're supposed to live differently than the world. There are aliens and strangers. So to live differently, you say, well, that's good. But how? How am I supposed to live differently? How should my life be structured so that it's different? How is it that I'm supposed to go about living a good and beautiful life in a dark and cruel world? Does any of this sound familiar? Relevant? Verse 15 says that it is the express will of God that all believers live this type of a life in every circumstance. And he's going to talk about the different circumstances. The one today relates to how we are supposed to live according to the will of God to live this good and beautiful life under whatever authority we have over top of us. Keep in mind, God has placed you under the government that's above you. He starts off today with the word. Dante already plucks the nerve of a lot of folks and it'll cause a lot of people just to start off just like this. Because it's the word submit. Submit. Matter of fact, we're told here to submit, Christian. So if you're not a Christian, this does not apply. If you're a Christian, it does. Every Christian is told to submit to every, notice in your Bible, it should say every, because it says it in mine, 
every human institution. I mean, every governing body that is over you, you're to submit to it. And he goes on to say it could be the king, or it could be, in this case, since their government was structured differently, anybody that the king would send down, any governor that he would send down to act on his authority. And he's supposed to enforce the laws and to keep order. And it's a little different for us because we have a different type of government. We have a form of government where we, we elect, for the most part, officials. But in regardless of how they got to be in authority over us, we're commanded to submit to their authority. So what does the word submit mean? Literally, it means to place yourself under the rules and the laws and the directives of someone else. Put yourself under someone else and under their authority. The word is very similar to the one that Jesus used in the Beatitudes. When he said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. It's in Matthew 5, 5. Blessed are the meek. It's a very similar word to submit. It means to take, it doesn't mean to cower, it doesn't. Meek don't mean weak. It means to take the strength that you have, but let it be harnessed and controlled under certain circumstances. And here, we use this as being the strength that we have, everything that we have, and the abilities we have, and even as we talk about the freedoms we have, we submit, we put them under the authority of someone else, to voluntarily place our strength under the control of others. Now God has given to us three institutions. The family, the government, and the church. And looking at the church today, he says, you know, one of the purposes of the church is to public, uh, punish evildoers and to praise those who do right. Basically saying the purpose of the government is supposed to keep order and provide good things for people who obey the laws, who do right. Without government, I always we didn't have it, really. Without government, it's complete anarchy and chaos. There'd be no safety. None. No rights. None. No peace. None. So you'd be at the mercy of anybody who desired to have anything that you have. And you'd have no recourse. I'll sue them. No, you can't sue them, but you take them to a court. There's no courts. Why? There's no government. But we do have government. And for the most part, governments are there to provide the security that we need. We can go to bed at night, turn the lights off, and sleep, and not with one eye open. We, for the most part, have justice. We, for the most part, have laws that protect our rights to, to work, to raise a family, to gather together like we're doing right here in a church in a house of worship. And we do these things without fear. And so for the drawbacks and all the things that we like to complain about with government, we too often forget all the things that we enjoy. You know, we have the 4th of July and everybody's running around with red, white, and blue and little flags and we are just so happy and wonderful and praising and the other 364 days a, a year we are moaning and griping and complaining. You see, we enjoy one of the most favorable forms of government that this world knows. But let me tell you, and this is an important thing for us as Christians to remember, there has never been, nor will there ever be, a Christian nation on this earth. Never. Never. Because even during the Millennial Kingdom, there'll still be sinners. For those of us who want to fix our government so we can be a Christian nation, folks, it has never happened and it ain't going to. But even saying that, 
God has commanded all believers to submit to every human institution. And my goodness, if Peter can say that, and his government was Nero, how hard should it be for us to submit to whatever authority is over us? So why does God tell us to do that? Why does he tell us that since we're a believer, we have to submit to every human institution? Why? Well, it's simple. Because we're not the permanent residents here. We're just passing through. I don't know if any of you have ever traveled. Many of you have not, but some of you might have. Have you ever traveled to a foreign country? Because immediately, you will find that as soon as you step on that soil of this foreign territory, you will quickly find out that you're under the laws and the authority of that government. You can't say, well, no, I'm an American, so it doesn't carry anything. There's an NBA basketball star that's in Russia right now, and they found some drug paraphernalia in her luggage. If she had gone to the airport in, in California, uh, she'd have probably you know, been a hero. But since they found it in hers, it constitutes the description of smuggling. And she has a chance of having to serve 10 years in a Russian prison because she's under those laws. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you, just if you ever travel, let me tell you, do not litter in Singapore. Let me just tell you another one. Do not steal an apple in downtown Baghdad. I'll take your hand. I'll tell you another one. Do not stand on the Great Wall of China on a box and start preaching the gospel. It's against the wall. There's other ways, by the way, in China to get the gospel out, but that ain't one of them. You see, they have ways that you can. So you might be in that foreign country, I don't know, just for a short period of time, just for a couple of days, maybe a week, maybe a month. But you are still under the authority of that country as long as you're there. Even if you don't approve of it, even if you don't like it, and even if you don't agree with it. Tough. You're under that authority and you have to submit. But Peter says here in verse 16, if you read that, he says, you know, but as Christians, we're free men. The authority of man on us, on this earth, has no authority over us. You see, we serve a higher ruler. We're citizens of somewhere else. And we're just passing through. We're just visiting here. We're like tourists. But he also says, don't use this freedom that we have as free men. Don't use it as an excuse to be insubordinate, to be antagonistic, or brutish. Just because we are free and we serve under a higher authority, and the time that we're here where we're under a human authority, But we're not to use it as an excuse to be ugly, to be disrespectful. Remember, we are called to live a good and excellent and beautiful life among the lost. That's what 12 and 13, 11 and 12 said. Live that life. You're under the authority of God. He is your authority. But while you're visiting in this country, submit to the authorities that are here. And why? Because the only reason they have authority in this country or any other is because God has allowed them to have that authority. Read Romans 13. Our calling and our direction when it comes to our behavior toward whatever government or whoever is governing at the time 
is to be lived out in the context of our participation as the church. That means that our motivation isn't bolstered by which laws get passed or which laws don't get passed. It's our motivation has nothing to do with about who the next appointee to the Supreme Court is. It has nothing to do about Republican or Democrat or fiscal responsibility or even whether or not they open a gas pipeline. Folks, that has nothing to do with our motivation in our relationship with the government that is above us. Our first and foremost motivation when it comes to our political, quote unquote, activity is to glorify God and to bring about the gospel message to those who are around us. That's what we're here for. So God has placed each one of us here, this day, this time, this locale, whether it's state, locality, country, He has placed all of us here today for what? To live under whatever circumstances we're under, and while being here, to focus on sharing the gospel with the lost people around us, either by word or action, and both. We're supposed to be shining the light of love and peace and mercy in every little dark nook and cranny of this world. Now understand, I am not saying that we cannot be critical of our government when it's appropriate. Because our government has allowed and set aside a structure where that isn't possible. It's not in all governments, but it is in ours. We're allowed to speak up and to speak out. We're allowed to vote people in and people out. We're allowed to practice civil obedience and even participate in peaceful demonstrations. But in any of those activities that we're allowed to do within the confines of the government to which we're called to submit to, we have to be careful to examine our motives. Are we seeking our will? Or are we seeking to obey God and to live that good and excellent and beautiful life that he calls us to live that will shine light so that others might know Christ and glorify the Father? That's the question for every action, every statement, every comment, ever, every behavior. Because if you're going to work really, really, really hard just to try to get people to act and think and speak and do the things that you think are you like, and you want everybody to be like you, it ain't going to happen. We are not called to make this planet, this country, heaven. And trying to get the world to conform to how we think things ought to be, how we think things ought to have, uh, be like, who we want to be our rulers. It's a waste of what little precious time that we have here on this earth. Because folks, if this is going to happen, you're going to waste a lot of time that we have in glorifying God by sharing the gospel with other people. God's telling us that we need to submit to the authority that he has placed us under. You don't think God knows who our president and our senate and our supreme court is? Like God doesn't know these things? In the same way that we have suffering, you don't think God knows that you're suffering? But what he's looking for is how do you respond to all of those things? God is telling us to submit to the authority that He has placed us under. And while we are there, or here, under that authority, we're supposed to be living as temporary residents. While we're here, honor or respect all men. That includes leaders. That's why we're told to pray for our leaders. 
honor all men. Love the brotherhood. That's the church. Fear God. And honor the king. Be not like him. For we're to honor. If nothing else, the authority of position. But Peter is saying, and again, remember the light in which he is writing this letter, which makes our complaints and our problems with our government look sad and pathetic. He says, look, let us live such a good and beautiful life for everyone to see and to live such a life with kindness and generosity and grace without mumbling and grumbling and complaining all the time. And we're to live that kind of life. Why? Not because we want to be good citizens of this country. But we're supposed to live that kind of life because we are citizens of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're called to live every single day not for our sake, but for His. Live every day for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we got enough problems trying to conform ourselves into the likeness of Christ without wasting all of our time trying to get the world and the governments to conform to what we would like them to be. Live every day for the sake of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. We bow with you. Lord God, we often take the, the privileges and the liberties that we have and the freedoms that we have so much for granted. Lord, we forget those who operate under such uh, much more severe circumstances. The scripture here to honor the submit to the authority that is placed over us. Lord, sometimes that's a hard pill for us to swallow, particularly when I think of the Christians that are serving in the day of Peter and those who are serving in a good part of the world today. And so, Lord, I'd ask for their protection. But, Lord, the church has always grown when it's under the most severe persecution. Not because they changed the persecutors, but because the persecution has changed them. And so, Lord, as we place ourselves under the authority of those that you have placed above us, let us do so, Lord, gladly that we might see opportunities and doors that are open that we can concentrate on the most important of all things in our lives. And that is to share the gospel message and what little time that we have with those around us and what we say and how we live our lives. Thank you, Father, for every opportunity you give us. Please forgive us in all the many ways we fail you and lead us to be stronger and more devoted in all that we do.